The following interview was conducted with Professor Sunny Rasama Swami, Director of Agricultural Research Programs and Associate Dean of the College of Agriculture for the Free University Oral History Program. This is part two, and it took place on Thursday, July 16, 2009, in his office uh, on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Well, Good thanks. Good morning. Okay. Thank we, you. Thank we'll you very pick much. pick it up from uh, Kansas then. All right. Yeah, we were talking about uh, Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, and as I said to you, uh, we were there for, uh, I was there for eight and a half years as a department head, and I was telling you that I had a, a tremendous time, I had a blast really being a department head, and one of my colleagues, Jim Knuckles, had asked me, what's it take to be a successful department head, and, and I told him it's a piece of cake, and really, uh, as long as you think of how you're going to enable others, whether it's the faculty or the staff or the students or just the people, the stakeholders, you know, the moms and pops and the farmers and ranchers, etc. How do you enable them to achieve the best they can and then it becomes a piece of cake. And so uh, that's the approach that I took and, uh, and I was very, very successful at it. I, you know, even if I say so myself, well, I mean also the proofs of the pudding as it were. Um, I was, uh, uh, President John Weefall, as I said to you, made me, uh, 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 gave me the Outstanding Department Head Award. It's a, an award that uh, the university has developed. And that was uh, very, very highly gratifying that I was nominated by uh, the faculty in the department and the College of Agriculture as well. And Mark Johnson, the former dean, nominated me as well. So that was highly gratifying. And, and really, I think... I, you know, last time we talked, I talked about accountability, responsibility, wanting to make a difference, and and that's been my philosophy, and that's the approach that I've taken, both as a, a teacher, researcher in my own life, as a faculty member, uh, as a parent of a, a, a single child, and and also as a department head, and that's worked, you know, paid dividends as a matter of fact, and uh, it's very easy to follow that rule if you stick to it and not worry about you're getting the credit or who gets the credit uh, because at the end of the day we are a public institution and ultimately it is the taxpayers of our states and of our nation that are paying uh, for us to uh, do what needs to be done and really that's who needs to get the credit and that's the uh, message I always sent to our faculty and I'll tell you, when I first became a department head, one of the first things that I did was to print out the mission statement of our college, of our department, and hung it up on the wall in the conference room. And whenever uh, our faculty would start talking about teaching or research or other extension efforts or whatever it was, when the faculty, and you know, all faculty, by human nature, all of us, it's not just faculty, it's me as well, you as well, we're all territorial and we're all wanting to uh, you know protect our own turfs and we're very protective of our time you know and yeah there is a, a certain amount of altruistic behavior as well but we tend to be protective and so they would you know we would talk about something that needed to be done and they become protective about it and get into an argument and not move forward and as a department head what i did was i said okay guys, folks step back a little bit and take a look at that mission statement on the uh, on the wall. And what it talks about is we're gonna do everything we can to train the best students to be leaders. We're gonna do everything we can to offer the best, discover the best information and deliver that information to the farmers and ranchers and moms and pops. So if we're agreed that's what we're doing, why don't we go ahead and talk about the teaching that we need to do or the research we need to do or the extension we need to do in that uh, manner. So that's the approach that I took. And uh, we went from a department that was really, I'd say, a mediocre, also ran department. Our research portfolio, for example, when I first got there, was about three to $400,000 a year. It was highly dysfunctional. Uh, the department had gotten factionalized in part because of the former department head, in part because of the personalities of the faculty as well. In fact, to the extent that they weren't talking to each other, some of the faculty. And there were only about, I don't know, 12 or 13 graduate students at the time. 
uh, back in 1997 when I first got there. And it took us about three years. We turned things around. And Mark Johnson, the dean, had said to me, the very first thing you got to do, Sonny, is to work with the faculty to help them bridge their differences. They've gotten highly factionalized. And that took me about a year, a year and a half to work. And then bring in the former department head into the fold as well. And make him a part of the department and make him a contributing member of the department. And so by... He was, he was still on the faculty. Oh, he was still on the faculty. He was asked to step down by the dean. And he was still on the faculty. And by 1999, 2000, we turned things around. And to the extent that... Uh, you know, we had uh, about 50 graduate students in the department, and our grants portfolio uh, went up to well over uh, $2.5 million a year, and everybody was a player. The expectation that I articulated was that everybody needed to be a player. Everybody needed to be contributing. Everybody needed to, and what I did was, again, I said, I use the carrot policy, as it were, not the carrot and stick policy, but just the carrot policy. And got even underperforming faculty to step up. And the other thing that happened, too, was Kansas State University is the first major institution in America that has, as part of its policies, post-tenure review. Okay, That is, even though you're a tenured professor, you can't kind of sit and say, okay, I'm tenured, I don't need to do anything. That on your annual evaluations as a faculty member, you're evaluated based on criteria that it was a sort of a, a fortuitous coming together. My arriving there and the university, uh, the former provost, Jim Kaufman, and the university coming to grips with this because the taxpayers are tired of this lack of accountability, as you know. And it was a coming to grips saying, you know, before the taxpayers, i.e. the legislature, forces us to do things like they did in Minnesota. Kansas State University said, we're going to do it. We're going to set in place a way for us to be held accountable. And that was post-tenure review. And so I got there at the same time, and I was very much interested in that. You know, accountability is very important to me. Sure. Right. And so I worked with our faculty to develop the protocols and the policies and procedures and the standards that was developed during that same period of time and set in place and so suddenly we used that approach to help bring underperforming faculty up to the par and because all the raises were tied into it all the expectations were tied into that and they needed to have a grants portfolio they needed to be teaching they needed to be involved in extension and outreach they needed to be involved in discovery and research uh, they needed to be uh, involved in teaching and learning, okay? And no questions asked. You might have, a, you know, in colleges of agriculture, we have research extension teaching splits. Some people think it's set in stone. And I said, that's for the bean counters to worry about, where the dollars come from. At the end of the day, my, oh, my all-time favorite statement, there's a guy named Dan Koshland, who was the publisher of Science Magazine. And in 1987, in an editorial, he had said, people have problems, institutions have departments. And it's my all-time favorite saying. And it's seared in my brain, and I would point that out to our faculty. You know, the average person on the street doesn't care if you have a research appointment or a teaching appointment or an extension of appointment. Not. They have them don't even know that that exists. Exactly. They care about their problems. And you and I have been given this incredible privilege to serve as faculty. And so we ought not to be worried about, a, my appointment is 60% research, 40% teaching, and his appointment is 70% extension, 30% research, etc. Okay? We're all in it for the same purpose. And, and we did that, we turned things around, and I mean, we did tremendous things. And in fact, I think that was part of the reason why I got that uh, nominated by the, the dean for that award, for the, uh, the uh, Outstanding Department Head Award. And along the way, and, and, and I love to have fun, it's very important to have fun, and of course, bugs, you know, as an entomologist, bugs allow you to have that fun, and you can still be a little kid. 
Uh, I'd go around, did a lot of work, and I encouraged our faculty, expected, not encouraged, expected our faculty to be involved in outreach. Not from an extension perspective, but outreach to the community, to the schools, etc. And so we went and did things in the communities. Uh, and so I did everything by example. I had an excellent research program, so I could, if I went and talked to a faculty member, hey, you need to write an NSF, a National Science Foundation grant proposal. I'd been there, done that. I was doing it. I'd been rejected by them. And there's tears in it and, and angst in it, but you go over it and you write the proposal even better. Come up with a better way of articulating your ideas. And if I talked about, to faculty about teaching, I'd been there, done that. I'd taught classes as a department, and although I was not expected to do so. I had the largest research program at, at Kansas State University as a department head. As a faculty member, I had the largest research program than faculty in my department, in many departments in the college and in the university. Uh, I'd been and worked with farmers, although I did, wasn't expected to do that in the extension mode and outreach mode and things like that. And the important thing of having fun doing these things, faculty tend to forget, you know, oh my gosh, I gotta get tenured, and I point out to them, it's not about tenure. It's not that end point. It's that, in quotes, journey to get there and have fun doing it. You know, you've had this privilege that millions of others would give their right arms to do. Why don't you teach and enjoy it? Why don't you do research and enjoy it? Why don't you do extension and enjoy it? And so the enjoyment as an entomologist is easy because bugs are very enjoyable. Even today, I will collect an insect and look at it and eat it, for example. Get stung by it, get bitten by it, look at the smell and uh, you know, whatever. Uh, as an aside, I gotta tell you, you know, I, I told you I met my wife in India uh, when she came to study for her master's degree. Uh, and I romanced her, entomologically as it were, and one of those, uh, and, and you know, we used to go collecting insects, et cetera, together. And my wife did not come with an uh, entomology background or an agricultural background, and I did, you know, in college. And uh, so I remember one time we were standing waiting for a bus. We used to use the city bus in those days. This is back in 1974. Waiting for a bus to take, to go back home. And I was with her, and we're next to a sewer where we were standing, waiting for the bus. And this sewer, this is out in the rural area uh, where the agricultural college was, and the sewer, unfortunately, had uh, contamination from, uh, uh, from homes where you were getting the, the effluent from toilets. So you can imagine what kind of sewer it is. And we're standing there, and in those days I used to smoke cigarettes, and I was smoking a cigarette, we're talking, and suddenly I saw something wiggling in this water, in the sewer. And I said, oh my gosh. Immediately I said, oh my gosh. There's only one bug that wiggles around in that, other than mosquitoes. And we had plenty of mosquitoes collected. And it's called a rat-tailed maggot. And it's uh, the immature stage of a fly called a hoverfly. And it's a big, fat, juicy, white maggot. It's about oh, half inch to an inch in length and about more than a quarter of an inch in diameter. Got a big, fat, white, juicy thing. And it puts out this long telescopic tail, like a rat's tail. And in that sewer, in that water, that dirty water, it puts this telescopic tail to come out above the surface of the, it breaks the surface of the water, the surface tension of the water, and opens up this pore, its nostril as it were, through which it breathes in air, okay? <laughs> Sucks in the air and then goes down deep below and eats the uh, critters growing in there and then comes back up again once in a while to breathe. Very characteristic, very rare. And I didn't know what to do. Usually you'd use a dipper to dip it out. I rolled up my sleeve literally or figuratively. I don't know, I don't recall what I was wearing. Probably a half sleeve shirt because it was warm and being in the tropics, I stuck my left hand into that sewer containing this effluence from the toilets. 
and grabbed a hold of some of those maggots and brought them out. And, and, and the cigarette packs in India have a, like a plastic wrap around them on the outside, like we do here in America as well, around Marlboros, etc. I pulled that out and had my wife, now wife, then colleague, hold that and it dropped it in there with a little bit of water, of that water, caught several of those, held it like that, with literally, pardon me for saying this, crap stuck to the, sure. my hair on my arm, and held it like that, got on the bus, and people were wondering what I had in my hand, and we got home, and I uh, put it in alcohol, you know, in, in rum, I think, is what we had, and put a little water in rum, Usually we use a 70% ethanol solution. I put it in there. And I shared some with my then colleague. And she was so impressed that I had gone to the depths of this, you know, uh, human effluent fill sewer. And uh, nailed her from that perspective, you know. And, and, and We went on from there, right? Yeah, we, we did. So... That's the fun part of it. And you convey that love of bugs and love of knowledge and things like that to the kids as well, working with the little children. And as I told you the other day, I, we you know, conceptualized this idea of an insect zoo. Entomology departments in, the, in, our, in, in America, we do spring flings and cricket spitting and things like that. And uh, we built an insect zoo, the most gorgeous facility that you can think of that's located in Manhattan, Kansas, on the campus of Kansas State University, and a butterfly conservatory as well. I, I sort of conceptualized it in Costa Rica, in the middle of a, uh, a rainforest, seeing these beautiful morpho butterflies. The morpho butterflies are, have a wingspan bigger than my uh, span on my hand, with, between my pinky and my thumb here and this beautiful iridescent colors. Saw that and suddenly I had this sort of a, an epiphany almost of building a butterfly conservatory, imagining those butterflies flying around in this glass house. And on campus, in the middle of campus, we have a Victorian glass house at Kansas State University in the gardens. And that's where we established, and the zoo is adjacent to it. It's a beautiful what a facility. Great facility. Yeah, so that's what I did. You know, was to enable people to enjoy life, to enjoy the research, to enjoy the uh, teaching, to enjoy the extension, to enjoy the outreach, and things like that. And so, for research, from a research perspective, we're really interested in in facilitating faculty to come together. So, as a department head, what I did was. I networked with the other departments, with the other colleges, with the other universities. And so I had a sort of an overview of the kinds of research going on. And I'd bring people together from our department, within our department, people working together, and other departments as well. One of the things that I did at faculty meetings was faculty meetings tend to be very boring, as you know. And so we got dealt with all the business electronically. Okay. The faculty meetings were used for substantive conversations, one of which was every faculty meeting, once a month, I had two faculty come in and spend an hour. They had to talk about something innovative in their research or innovative in their teaching or innovative in their extension activities. Two faculty did that. And as a result, people got to know more of each other and resulted in new collaborations that resulted between faculty, that resulted in new grants coming in. And so that was the, uh, the idea. And then I would put, you know, you need the proverbial grease to get the skids moving as well, which is money in this particular case, to get the preliminary data. And I had the ability to invest dollars in, and get them moving in the right direction and in a collaborative manner. Because where the action's at today from a research perspective is not the lone ranger researcher in his lab, in his lab coat in the middle of the night doing these things because the issues are so complicated today that it takes these sorts of multidisciplinary approaches and collaborations and things like that. So uh, that's how I was very successful in, in uh, helping faculty see the bigger picture sure. beyond the tips of their noses is how we approached it. And, and you know, I'd point out 
It's the imagination or the lack thereof that prevents us from looking beyond our own immediate world. All of us have this comfort zone. And I constantly point out getting beyond the comfort zone uh, and, and how you needed to step outside of that comfort zone and look for other opportunities. And that's how we got to be a very successful department. And so as I said to you, you know, Dirk Meyer, a faculty member at Purdue, is a former faculty member who now is at Kansas State University, was instrumental in my coming to Purdue. And Randy Whitson, you know, was convinced that I needed to apply, and he convinced me to apply, and I'm glad I did. And I came to Purdue on the 1st of January of 2006. I arrived here to become the Director of Agricultural Research Programs and Associate Dean for Research. Was it, a cold, was it a cold January day when you came? No, it was a gorgeous, sunny day. Uh, I drove from uh, Manhattan, Kansas to West Lafayette, Indiana. My wife uh, had become a department head of her department at K-State, and she had some commitments, and she wanted to stay put. Plus, we had a house that we needed to sell, and I started on the 1st of January. Came here, and I stayed at an apartment. And well, as an aside, another little personal tidbit. I stayed in this house on Northwestern Avenue. Uh, Sue Robinson is the uh, woman's name that owns the house. I lived in the back part. She had a little apartment-like thing, a little kitchenette and a bedroom. And I stayed there, and she had one of these Castro convertibles. It's an old iron sofa come bed. Heavy as heck. Heavy as heck. Right. It was in the middle of the room, and I brought my... My bed mattress, uh, like a full-size mattress and, and box spring and my clothes and a few boxes of my odds and ends and some kitchen stuff. Steve Yannernick, the head of entomology, helped me unload and move it in. Well, we set the mattress and that sofa was in the middle of the room and I needed to move it to the side of the room. And Not I an thought, job. well... I've forgotten that I'm on this side of 50 now, I was at that time, and, <laughs> and I started moving things around, and I did, put my mattress down, everything was hunky-dory, and I guess I must have done some damage because a couple of weeks later I collapsed uh, as I was going out to the sidewalk to put my garbage, my little bag of garbage, uh, I coming back, and I just collapsed literally. And I literally crawled into my apartment. And, oh, by the way, I had my laptop computer and my, uh, that I was gonna put in the truck, in my pickup truck. Because I was gonna be going out to Southern Indiana to meet some farmers to, And then I'm gonna drive up to Indianapolis and fly back to Kansas to see my wife and you know spend a couple of days for the weekend there. Early morning, 6 o'clock, my laptop was there on the sidewalk, and I crawled in, and I was laying in bed and started laughing because I was in pain. I was in intense pain in my lower back, and I couldn't move. I literally crawled in and crawled up to my bed, and in the pain, I said, I don't have a phone because I'd forgotten I left my cell phone on my desk in my office, and this is about 6.15 in the morning. And I was hoping my landlady, Sue, was going to be there. I didn't have any way of contacting anybody. Not my wife, not Nancy Aldrich, my then secretary. And then about 7.15, 7.30, I, and I'm in pain. I'm, I got tears in my eyes from the pain. And I hear some noises in the house where Sue lives. And I start banging on the wall, and Sue came, finally. And she was shocked to see me in writing in pain in, in bed. She asked me what happened. I said, I, I, I don't know what I did, but I messed up my back and I need some help. And if you could please call Nancy at this number. So Nancy comes into work at 7.30 itself, luckily. And Sue was able to call Nancy. Nancy came over there and she said, okay, come, let's go to the doctor. And I, she said, why don't you get up and use me as support and we'll walk to the car and I'll drive you. I could not bear my own weight and I collapsed again. And of course, you know, Nancy and Sue, Sue was older and they could you know, pick me up and mm -hmm. carry me out. So they called 911, an ambulance came and the stretcher, I got on the stretcher and we taken out. And in that pain, 
they're going down the steps and I'm telling those guys, hey guys, you got better be careful. And I remembered this joke, this entomological joke, and I started laughing in my pain. And the two guys carrying me to the ambulance were wondering what I was laughing about, and I had to share with them the joke. And as an aside, the joke is that, uh, true story as a matter of fact, that in New Orleans, this gentleman came home from work, <coughs> and uh, earlier that day, the wife had seen a cockroach. And apparently she stopped on it. And then she brought a can of whole can of Raid and sprayed on it. Then she picked up that with a paper or toweling or whatever, threw it inside the, in the uh, toilet, emptied another can of Raid, closed the toilet seat, and went away. The husband comes home, allegedly, and he goes and sits on the potty and lights up a cigarette, and he throws the, the uh, cigarette butt or match or whatever it is in the toilet, and of course the fumes of the raid that have the aerosol in it, propellant in it, explodes, and the toilet bowl allegedly explodes, and he's got you know damage to his rear end. So the wife calls 911, and the ambulance comes, and the stretcher is taking him, to add insult to injury, they wanted to know what happened, and the wife explains. One of the guys starts laughing so hard they drop the poor guy, apparently. <laughs> and so I shared this joke with these guys as well, and Nancy is wondering what's going on with me. But in any case, went to the emergency room, they gave me some shots. Long story short, later on I discovered that I had herniated three of my lumbar discs really badly. and prolapsed, as a matter of fact. Luckily, as it turned out, and my wife came from Kansas, picked me up, drove me back to Manhattan. I was bedridden for a whole month, and I was doing business with uh, IP video on my laptop computer. I continued to do my business, except I was stretched out on my back. Did they? You didn't have surgery or anything? No, I, I didn't. I did not have. I did not want to have surgery, okay. and with injections and and physiotherapy, and I still do it. This is almost you know four years later. I still do my stretches every day religiously, and you know. Uh, I've not had touch wood. I've not had any uh, issues, so got over it. So that's that was my start at Purdue University, and I was uh, uh, MIA, as they say, in uh, when I first started. Well, for the after I came back from uh, Kansas after a month, and I was hobbling around, and I couldn't wear shoes, and I'd be wearing a suit and no shoes, or one shoe, because my left foot I couldn't, you know, the sciatica was really bad, and I had had neuropathy as well on the tips of my toes and, and my foot, etc. Couldn't wear a shoe, shoe. And we had a, a big session in April of 2006 at, uh, um, at the Martell uh, Forestry Center, and there's a huge audience of some very important people and I get up to do a little spiel as the director of the uh, Ag Research Program and wearing a full suit and no shoes. Everybody that knew me knew that I was having problems, therefore I wasn't wearing a shoe. And in fact, the fellow that introduced me, our new director has had this problem, so he doesn't wear shoes, etc. Well, wouldn't you know it, somebody in the audience, one of the faculty members, apparently did not take too kindly to it sent an email to Randy Woodson saying that it was unprofessional of me. I was not representing Purdue University very well by having this cavalier attitude about not wearing shoes. And apparently he had missed somehow the story about my back problems and that had contributed to this issue. Well, again, these are little things that happen to you and, and people got to remember that there are reasons why people do certain things you know, and not jump to conclusions, right? And so, in front of, so my responsibility really is to, at, at Purdue, has been to facilitate research. And what I've done really is, as I said to you, what I did at K-State, was to focus on bringing people together. And we've done a tremendous number of things at Purdue University in our College of Agriculture. And we're equal opportunity. We work with every college. And again, I've done the same things. I put the proverbial grease on the skids to get the 
uh, the, the faculty to get together, to work together. It doesn't matter whether you're in engineering or in college of science or uh, college of technology or pharmacy or the vet school or consumer and family sciences. Um, all of this is very important. So as the director of the Ag Research Program, I have two responsibilities. One is I am in charge of agricultural research at Purdue University, which is not only in the College of Agriculture, but also in the vet school. Yeah, and, in yeah. Yeah. and in consumer and family sciences. And that comes from the federal mandate. As a land-grant university, we get federal dollars to address the needs of society, and we undertake research. And so I'm the responsible individual for it. And so we facilitate research in these three colleges. And then as the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Agriculture, I'm in charge of research facilitation for our college. But, you know, anymore, again, the issues are so complicated, you're going to have to work on multidisciplinary approaches that we take. And uh, we, that's what we do in our college, is help our faculty become more competitive for grants and contracts to address, it's not the money in and of itself, but what the money allows our faculty to do, which is to address these fundamental questions that need to be addressed, whether it's in the environmental issues, climate change, global warming, bioenergy, feeding the poor, uh, environmental issues, water issues, land use issues, using nanotechnology to address these issues, using biotechnology to address these issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And our portfolio has really increased tremendously in our college, in our university, at Purdue University as well. And one of the things that, uh, that I've done personally from our office, I've got people that I've hired. Carl Hudeman's one of the fellows that I've hired, a tremendous fellow that we've hired, is to create what I call as intellectual communities. That is, you want to bring together a community of individuals with the intellectual capacity to address these societal challenges we face, these global challenges we face. These global challenges are in the, the realm of health, in the realm of our ecological footprint, in the realm of agricultural competitiveness, in the realm of what I call as the bioeconomy, finding substitutes for petroleum. These are challenges we face. And what we do is, and so we want to bring the best brains. They might be in our college, they might be in the other colleges, they might be other, at other universities, they might be in the non-governmental realm, they might be in the corporate realm. And we bring these, we, we act as a convener. That's the approach that I've taken is to, we want to be the convener of bringing people together. And then we want to be the broker as well. We're going to put money on the table for you, for you to work with other colleagues. Okay, so we broker these relationships, we convene as well, we offer a platform. So people have asked me, so what's it take to have intellectual communities? And I say it takes three things to bring this to fruition. The first one, for faculty members, they have to have intellectual stimulation. If there is no intellectual stimulation, they're not interested. What about curiosity? That is, okay. that's it. Intellectual stimulation, right. subtending it is the curiosity. Mm -hmm. Okay? Two, money or the prospect of money. And three, food. Okay. What do we do? We put out a call. There might be a particular opportunity. We put out a call to the entire, depending on who it is, what area it is. It might be just within our college, just within a department, just an individual, or it might be multiple colleges, or it might be multiple other universities as well. We put a call out, and we bring in people from outside via IP video, uh, internet protocol video on the computer. Or and we offer a room, we bring them together, and I use my foundation credit card, Sherry, my administrative assistant, orders food. Because faculty are very busy people, and we found that lunchtime approximately is a good time to get them together. And we buy the lunch, let them eat, and have at it, talk, develop these ideas, develop the concepts, how are they gonna do this, why, et cetera develop the objectives. And that's the approach we've taken. And we've been very successful in helping address, get additional new grants and addressing some of these societal challenges that we face. 
I'll give you a couple of examples. One of them is, you know, we're converting uh, corn into ethanol. And as you make ethanol from corn, one of the co-products or the byproducts of it is called the dist distiller's grain. And that's starting to pile up in our nation. And we got started getting phone calls from around the state saying, hey, what are we going to do? Are we going to bury it, burn it, and build a mountain of what it? What do you do with it? What do we do with it? Yeah. And we put a call out to our faculty. And about 45 faculty came together. And there's a self-selection process. And we said, this is not of academic interest. This is people's livelihoods. You have nine months as a rapid response to come up with a response on what we're going to do. So agricultural economists, uh, agronomists, animal scientists, agricultural engineers all got together, came up with experiments to do, how to develop it, how to deliver the information once the knowledge had been developed. Okay. I put money on the table. My extension counterpart put my, we talked them into putting money on the table. All the department has put $50,000 each. Got the Indiana State Department of Agriculture to put money. We collected $800,000 in two days and deployed the intellectual capacity of these individuals to come up with answers. And then the expectation was they're going to offer workshops and other means of communicating this information. On the website, we have a website, you can check it out, that this information was developed. Another area of endeavor that we very recently might have read in the uh, in Purdue Today or in the newspaper, et cetera, was successfully the first $20 million grant that Purdue University has gotten. Uh, uh, this was the U.S. Department of Energy called for grants called the Energy Frontiers Research Centers Opportunity. And we brought together, convened these individuals from the College of Agriculture, Science, and Engineering, and Argonne National Labs in Chicago, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in, in Colorado, and the University of Tennessee folks together, and wrote this successful grant proposal. Our faculty wrote it. We didn't write it. I mean, we just gave them a platform to come together and talk to each other. We, our role as the director of ag research programs, the way I've seen it, is to eliminate any obstacles that faculty might face, okay? If a faculty member says, you know what, I want to be able to do this, but uh, we're talking about IRB approvals, Institutional Review Board approvals. Uh, the folks that are in charge of compliance are telling me I can't do it, I need six months to do it. So I will personally make phone calls to people like Peter Dunn or others asking, hey, why is it this way? Might be a faculty member that needs a 220 volt outlet to plug in a particular piece of equipment and they're stuck. And I'll call facilities, or Steve Hawkins in my office will call facilities, or I will personally call them. And so it's all relationships and networking. One of the first things that I did for the first one month after coming to Purdue was had Nancy Alders, then my then administrative assistant, have me meet with the vice president for facilities, the police chief, the uh, REM people, the radiation and environmental management people, and, and Carol Shelby, uh, and others of relevance to our faculty. So they know who I am and I know who they are. If I need to, I can make a phone call. If I need to, I and can And you know call. exactly what their responsibility exactly. is. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, That's the approach it. that I took was, because all of these things are based on relationships. If I called Carol Shelby, if I called Bob McMains, the Vice President for Facilities, or if I called Pete Dunn, the Associate Vice President for Research, uh, or Jim Mullins, your boss, or Scott Brandt in the library. They know who I am and, and they say, of course we can help you. And that's one thing about Purdue University is fantastic, is people are willing to help enable to achieve great things. And Martin Jiske, man, what a great guy. And, and in, in many ways, he's my administrative uh, role model and hero, I think, okay? and of, of articulating ideas, getting people to work together on, on reaching for the, 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 the greats, uh, great heights that we need to reach. So that's what we and do. It instills it yeah. in within you. Exactly. So the idea is to eliminate obstacles. The idea is to bring people together to work together. Oh, one other thing that we've done, very innovative, I think, 
and I share this with others as I go around. In addition to the rapid response teams, these intellectual communities, et cetera, et cetera, one thing that we've done is we hold, the thing that our faculty told me, has, have told me over and over again, is the lack of knowledge of who does what and why and to whom, et cetera. So we offered speed dating, okay? Speed dating, people laugh at this. They say, well, yeah, what we do is we bring our, we put a call out, have faculty sit across from each other. You're given three minutes to say what you do and why you do what you do, what your expertise is, what your interest is. And Carl Huderman, the fellow that works in my office, he blows a whistle, and then it's my turn to tell you what I do, why I do, and what my interests are, and where do I want to go, et cetera. And then after three minutes, he whistles again, and we swap partners, and we, they swap partners. And so, in about three hours' time, you've met everybody in the room of 40, 50, 60 people, and you've gotten a better knowledge of who does what and why, et cetera. As a result, new grants have come up because of that, so because of the speed dating that's occurred. Somebody asked me if the speed dating has resulted not only in research marriages, but also personal marriages, and I said, no, at least not yet. I don't think so, but who knows? Maybe it'll happen as well. You know somebody would have to come up with that. <laughs> right, right. And uh, so point. those are some of the approaches that we've used in facilitating our faculty to do great things in, in research. You know, And really, at the end of the day, my role and my responsibility is, one, as a facilitator, two, as a convener, three, as a broker, four, as a remover of obstacles, and five, as an advocate, and I brag about it every place I go. It might be on campus, it might be meeting with the soybean farmers, or the corn farmers, or the livestock producers, or uh, Senator Luger, or, you know, uh, Buy's staff, or uh, Brad Ellsworth, I, you know, we go down to Vincennes, you know, where we have a sort of Purdue Ag Center, and or in Washington, any place we got, or Indianapolis with, uh, you know, Mitch Daniels, the governor, or Becky Skelman, the lieutenant governor. We brag about these things as well. We look for things, and and the only way you can brag is not, you know, based on uh, uh, falsehoods, but really on the incredible things our faculty do at Purdue University and our staff do as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so in ag research, it's a huge portfolio that we have. It's mind-boggling, the portfolio. When you think of agriculture, you think, must be food production, right? Row crop agriculture, or livestock agriculture. Well, imagine for the carton of milk that you buy at the local grocery store, at Kroger's or other grocery store, Marshy's. Behind that milk, that beautiful carton of milk, is the blood, sweat, and tears of the farmer having to deal with the manure, having to deal with the smell of the particulates in the environment, of uh, you know, uh, water, of the land, all these things. And we address those issues here at Purdue University in our College of Agriculture and in other, coll other colleges as well. And you know, uh, we do genetics, we do genomics, we do behavior, we do forestry, we do we work on eagles, we work on cows, we work on fish, we work on plants, we work on nanotechnology. For example, food safety is a huge issue that we have in America today. Okay, people eating contaminated E. Uh, e. coli contaminated spinach or or uh, uh, alfalfa sprouts and things like that. Mm -hmm. We've got faculty like Rich Linton who are specialists in this, who address these questions. And we convene faculty to come together and work on addressing these things. Or bioenergy is a huge issue. Uh, we have faculty working on it like Mike Ladish or Nate Mosier or Maureen McCann or Nick Carpita. These are people that are experts. They're like at the top of the game that address these sorts of questions. Climate change is a big thing we're talking about. How do we mitigate carbon being emitted into the environment. And we've got a number of faculty addressing carbon, carbon uh, 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 footprint and climate change and things like that. Or forestry, we've got faculty that work on developing better ways of making furniture. For example, Rado Gazzo in our forestry department is doing some beautiful work. You know, I don't know if you know this, but the Vietnamese and Chinese are the biggest buyers of our wood 
uh, timber mm -hmm. in our state. So what Rado has done is to figure out how to keep the high-end black walnut and cherry and red cherry and things like that here for our wonderful furniture industry of southern Indiana so we can give a leg up and employ people and things like that on the very high-end furniture. So you're looking at a desk, a cheap desk you can buy from Vietnam, made in Vietnam or China for under $1,000. A high-end desk with the most beautiful wood that's placed in the president, you know, in the White House or other corporate offices in America. These things cost $10,000, $15,000. And the research done by Rara Dazzo and, and his wife, Eva uh, Havariova, has contributed to this thing. Purdue, we also do genetics and breeding of plants and trees. The black, Purdue black walnut tree is tremendous. It grows straight as an arrow, beautiful wood that uh, our Harwood Tree Improvement Research Center uh, does research on. So that's the sort of the portfolio that we have. We have people working on water, you know, and water, we're gonna see more wars about water as we go forward than we will have seen on petroleum. Because water is a seriously diminishing commodity for us with the increase in population, things like that. So as we go forward, what we have to be worried about is how are we gonna feed the nine billion people, today we have six billion people. By the year 2050, we're gonna have nine billion people. How are we gonna feed them? How are we gonna clothe them? How are we gonna allow them to drive around, et cetera? Agriculture, the renewable commodities of agriculture are at the core of addressing these needs. So that's what we're doing research on. Very good. And you, uh, and you realize the value when you see the results that oh, you yeah. can. It is. It's highly gratifying right. to see that that you can indeed make a difference in people's lives. One thing I was going to ask you, here the extension is separate, and I noticed in your new position you will be in charge of the uh, extension services as well. Is that true with what uh, the dean here is to handle that? So it's similar, right. even though so, you have a head of extension. That, right. The, uh, the dean of the College of Agriculture supervises myself as the director of agricultural research programs, as well as Chuck Hibbard, who is my extension counterpart, who is the director of extension. Right. And at Purdue, what we, in fact, I go around as well as Chuck goes around saying, you will not see any daylight between research and extension at Purdue University. We're like the yin and yang of Purdue agriculture. We're completely seamlessly interconnected. Because, as I said early on, you know, it's a continuum between the research and the delivery of that. In fact, Franz Cordova, our president's new strategic plan, talks about discovery with delivery. And where she came up with that concept really was looking at the model we have in agriculture, which is the seamlessness in the research enterprise and the extension enterprise as one seamless continuum. And, and that's the way it is. And even my new position as the Dean of College of Agricultural Sciences at Oregon State University, I'm gonna be overseeing that. And again, it's, it's that sort of a, an expectation that I present. You, although I am the keeper of research, I always talk about this continuum of undertaking this, this discovery to generate new knowledge and then delivering it to the end users. You cannot forget that. You cannot stand in a vacuum. Going back to, as I said the other day, Donald Stokes' book, Pasteur's Quadrant, it talks about that is you generate the knowledge and you use it, put it to use and deliver it to the end users. Right. And that's the way we do it. Right. Yeah, agriculture has been doing it actually well, for a very long time. Let's focus on the land grant, that's in the land grant act. Absolutely. That's exactly it, so it goes all the way back. Yeah. And, and that's what, what's been done. Exactly. Right? exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, you talked about a couple of your awards. One thing I was gonna ask you about, the distinguished graduate alum, alumnus from uh, Cook College. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a graduate of Rutgers University, as I said the other right, day. Yeah. And Cook College is the agricultural college out there. That's very nice. And uh, they had a, a, you know, they do once a year, they select distinguished alumni. And I was the graduate school's alumnus as well. And so uh, I was a very gratifying event. This was about, oh gosh, five, six years ago, I think they did it. I forget exactly when it happened. Uh -huh. And my daughter came. My wife was traveling in Portugal at that time, I believe. And so she wasn't able to attend it. I went to New Brunswick, New Jersey uh, for the ceremony. Oh, all the pomp and circumstance uh, that universities, you know, confer on you. And uh, 
And my daughter, who used to live in New York City at that time, she took a train and came in and, and met up with me. It was all oh, fantastic, very gratifying. Again, you know, alumni awards are given to people. I wish they give it to everybody, you know, because everybody's done great things. And for whatever reason, you know, somebody gets in the limelight for whatever reason, you know, maybe a quirk of fate or whatever it is or things that you end up doing. And, and the name rises and brings it to attention. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. And uh, so it was, it was pretty gratifying to, uh, to get it. And, and they, I guess I was still at K State, at Kansas State University at that time when I got the award. And, and they recognized my endeavors as a department head and the kinds of things that I talked about that uh, that was very highly gratifying. The other thing, you know, at K-State I became a university distinguished professor as well. And uh, I'm very proud of it. Probably more so than being the outstanding department head or other things. Because a university distinguished professor is conferred by your fellow faculty, as a faculty member, not as a department head, not as an administrator, because of achievements you've made in your research endeavors or your teaching endeavors, your scholarship, that is. And that was incredible to get all these folks to say, wow, you know, that was incredible. That was highly gratifying because they recognized my research endeavors, my research scholarship, as it were. And, uh, and it's not a, a in, in many ways, it's a, some of these awards become a beauty contest, you know? And the University Distinguished Professor, it, it, you got to rise to a very high level. And that's true of the ones here. Yeah, oh, of exactly. course, Purdue and it well. should be. It's know. a rarity for somebody to be recognized with that. And the other award that is also, you know, similarly very, very uh, gratifying for me as a, an individual scientist, as a, a scholarship of research, is becoming a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAA yeah, fellow, you know, right. and that's a pretty uh, rare event as well. And again, that is your national, international peers recognizing you, fellow scientists recognizing you. So one was at the university, and the other one was at national, international level, and that was uh, fantastic as well. Really, really nice to uh, be recognized. And it humbles you, you know. I mean, these things they humble you, saying, "Wow, that's pretty amazing." That there are others that think, you know, you oftentimes end up in that that little individual, you know, plugging away at something, and it's gratifying that there's somebody outside that says, "That's pretty cool stuff that you're doing." You know, we recognize you for it. And so we want to we want to take care of you from that standpoint. Yeah, that, yeah. That was, uh, yeah. And well, the next stage you're going to be going to t for the research, just tell them you're going to be going. And then I was going to ask you for an outstanding event and then some closing comments. Well, you mean that's any event here that sticks in my mind? Could be any place. Yeah, well, I think really... Um, I know you have many that we will also address, but it's been, yeah, it's been yeah, very yeah. nice. Well, you know what, really, sort of the, the almost a... a final feather in my cap, as it were, at Purdue University as a wrap-up, was hearing that the U.S. Department of Energy, Energy Frontiers Research Center's grant had been awarded to Purdue University. Maureen McCann, uh, Mahdi Abu Omar in chemistry, Maureen's in biology, Hilka Kintama is in, in chemistry, Rakesh Agarwal is in chemical engineering, and Dan Zemansky in our agronomy department in the College of Agriculture are the lead PIs, principal investigators. But along with them, there's like a bunch of other faculty in agronomy, in biochemistry, in botany and plant pathology in our college, and in biology and chemistry and uh, in, in science, and chemical engineering and materials engineering in engineering that all got together along with the Oregon National Labs in Chicago and the National Renewable Energy Labs in Colorado and the University of Tennessee folks getting together, writing that proposal. We facilitated it from my office. Carl Huneman really needs to be given the kudos. So in the newspaper, you know, of course, as should should be, they need to focus on Maureen McCann and, and Rakesh Agarwal and others and talk to them. But you know, in the background are a whole bunch of people that facilitate these things, bring this to fruition, and it's the Carl Hudemans of this world that helped do that. 
And, you know, they do it. Carl does this. No questions asked. He enjoys it. And to see that happen, uh, the first time that's happened at Purdue University, the first big energy, bioenergy grant that we've got. The biggest, actually, thus far. And I hope there's going to be many more right, of that. But we learned some lessons from it on how to bring people together, to work together. That's, that's key. The lessons learned is very, very important. And, and sort of the dissection, the, the Monday morning quarterbacking that you need to be doing, thinking about, well, what do we do right? What do we do wrong? What are the next steps, etc. To me, that well, was incredibly gratifying that we, because we had tried a couple other times previously, we hadn't succeeded. There were some issues, uh, approaches that were used that were inappropriate, incorrect. And then we step, had a chance to step up and do this. And to me, that really uh, sort of uh, puts the, uh, uh, the final exclamation mark on my stay here at Purdue University that we did it. And, uh, and I've had a small part in that to bring the people together and help them see. And again, we use the same thing. That is, hey, look beyond yourself. You know, look for the opportunity. And so that's a, a wonderful thing to go out on. And, and the other thing is really getting you know, people to work together. And, uh, As you step back and you realize that yeah, that's occurred. That is, that is it. That is probably the right. biggest contribution that I've probably made is to help people collaborate more and work together more and look beyond themselves. I'm still frustrated that I can't get more people to be thinking along those lines. There always but, has to be some. But like this you've has been done. Accomplishments yeah, have been made. Exactly. And as I go forward, I'm in mean, Oregon State University. Uh, the sky's the limit. I'm going to be the boss. And uh, so I have a lot of challenges out there. They're expecting me to raise a lot of money for doing a lot of wonderful things. The College of Agricultural Sciences is wonderful at Oregon State as well. Very much like our Purdue Ag, you know, very, very competitive. And the nice thing there is that it's not just row crop agriculture and fruit and tree production, et cetera. But fisheries and wildlife is part of the College of Agriculture as well. And the Marine Mammal Institute, the Hatfield Marine Mammal Institute in Newport, Oregon is part of it too. So I've been to all the farms that I wanted to, cotton farms and corn farms and soybean farms and livestock production, et cetera. But I'll get to go and chase whales in, uh, in Oregon because we have faculty out there that work on whales and salmon and things like that. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, uh, Oregon's a beautiful place. Uh, I'm a motorcyclist, as I said to you earlier. I have a Harley Davidson that I got. Planning on riding around, and I'll be on the road quite a bit. And, uh, you know, as I've used the word having fun, and that's a very important part of who I am, is I got to have fun. And I got to think of the possibilities, you know. So there's some tremendous possibilities that. Uh, in Oregon State. I'll continue to work with Purdue University because, you know, this is part of uh, my legacy here uh, is to work with faculty and uh, uh, and staff and students, etc. So this has been tremendous. What a what a what an opportunity that I was given and getting to meet the likes of Martin Jeske. Oh man, tremendous. So it's been great. Good. Thank you very much. This concludes the end. I really appreciate that. Very yeah, good. Thank you. And.